Hey guys, Adam Ray here for the About Last Night podcast. Thanks for coming back to the show. We missed you. Good to see you. All my ALN fans, what are we calling you? The Rabies? The Adam Rabies? That, nope, not that. We'll figure it out. Uh, appreciate you guys being here supporting the show. If you want to keep supporting it, of course, subscribe. Click that subscribe button in the bottom right corner. And then immediately click the bell so you can get notifications when new content drops, highlights, animations, all that good stuff. Comment on the videos. Share them with your friends and families and strangers. And uh, just enjoy all the, the goodies that are coming your way. All right? Great episode today. Let's get into it. Joish. Hey, it's Herbert. Mm-hmm. And you're listening to the About Last Night podcast, you slippery little son of a bitch. Mm-hmm. Not good, but they got a second and fourth next year. So it's, holy shit! Right. Now is that? Give me your. Um, you know, I went down to hoop with him and Kyle Allen a couple when I was doing this podcast with Mark Sanchez for Showtime yeah. Sports about a year ago, and then Showtime goes, you know, we want to be more X's nose. All this comedy that this Jewish guy was bringing it was a little too much for our taste. So, <laughs> but Mark and I became good buds, and we, you know, got to interview quite a few uh, cool people before that. And Darnell and I, he's a big comedy guy, so so uh, just became homies in the SC connection for for us. And yeah. and he was just, you know, staying real. Like he's like, I want to stay because I want to try to get a. Um, you know, he's like, I don't know. Anytime you get drafted by a team, you want to try to see it through. But then he's like, if I get to go, yeah. Uh, he goes, um, uh, if I am going to get traded, he goes, I just ask them, send me to somewhere, um, you know, with just a bunch of hot chicks. No, he was like, send me somewhere with uh, a chance to win and the team that wants me. And and I go, this seemed like, I mean, like things to ask, like the things to ask for. But then I'm also like, Dude, because it's such a business, and you know this better than I, like, right. do you have any, even when you can say, like, hey, if you're going to trade me, do this, do they even give you any consideration to your yeah. wants? Yeah, I think they give you the benefit of the doubt, right? If the two returns are exactly even, they will send you the better place that you might want to go. But right. no, if they can get, a, you know, a, the sixth pick overall or the seventh pick overall, they don't care what you want. They're going to get the better return. You know, right, so. right. Wow, so we went to Carolina. That's crazy. Is that yeah? So, I, you know, they're not gonna win. They're not winning there right away either. You know, they're probably a little better off than the Jets are. So, damn. You know, it's so funny. It's like you know, I have obviously want to keep Russ as as long as possible. I think he's a, a once in a lifetime talent. But yeah. I was for a second being like, you know, Sam and I becoming you know pretty chummy. Like uh, that's quite the in for your for my hometown team if uh, if that swap was made. But uh, but yeah. it's I mean. Do you get immune to the uh, the business of all the off season trades or even in season trades? Like, does nothing surprise you anymore? And and if so, what yeah. trade went down in any sport that made you go, "Oh, nobody's off limits"? Yeah, so it, I don't really get that swept up in it. But the Jets are my hometown team, right? Like right. of all the teams and all the sports, the only team I still really care about is the New York Jets for some reason. Wow. Yeah. What you is know? that reason? So, so that's why this sort of hit home, but. Like, you know, I saw the Rangers win the cup. I was in the building. I saw the Mets win the World Series. I was at Shea and all that stuff. Wow. And uh, so I just, you know, the Knicks were close, but uh, I just never seen the Jets do anything, really. And so, uh, you know, Sanchez was our our closest hope, you know, a couple of conference championship games on the road back to back. So out of nowhere, too. Isn't it crazy, too? And, and, you know, for my Seahawks, it's like we were, you know, had quite a bit of time going between the Super Bowl uh, and then the one that we won. And then the one that we lost as a, as a sports fan, like, do you ever get over the really bad losses? And have you seen like from just being around like the game so much and, you know, so many different games, like, do do you get a sense that like, like, I know just personally, like that Seahawks Super Bowl loss, the second one. Yeah. It'll probably never go away, but also like I can deal with it in a way that's not the guys who were on that team and saw that call. And now you're hearing even ex players right. talk about like what they were thinking and what they saw when Russ went into the shotgun versus giving it to Lynch. It's like they truly 
Like, I still hold on to, like, Little League games where I, like, slid in the home plate and my fat ass just couldn't get around the mitt. And my coach was, like, you know, even made a comment being like, if you weren't so fucking fat. And you're like, dude, I'm 10. Give me, <laughs> give me a break. But, like, do you think there is – how do you think these guys, like, deal with some of these insurmountable, like, losses? So you hear the players talk about it all the time. They remember the losses much more than the victories. Yeah. And, buddy, if, you, if you're able to, to forget about that loss, uh, then you, I think you're better than most fans. But I, I think fans <laughs> hang on to it more uh, than the athletes themselves do, honestly, unless you're specifically involved. Right. Like, Mar- Marshawn seems – he probably sleeps pretty well at night, right? Is there any doubt that Marshawn is not sleeping at night? No, because I think, like, at some point, too, and this is what I always say, I go, you got one Super Bowl. Like, how greedy yeah. truly – can you get obviously in the way things go down, but I'm sure the millions of dollars help when you're going back home, even though they say money doesn't buy happiness. But then I see like, you know, LeBron's house or fucking even like Rafael Nadal, I think did some, right. did some selfie from a somewhere in Italy. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Like, yeah. Like I think you're, you know, so Butler, who, Butler, who makes the pick, and this was we had him last year. We had Tennessee on Monday night, and I asked him. I said, "Do you get asked more about the in- interception to Ooh. win the Super Bowl there, or being benched and not playing a second in the Super Bowl by Belichick?" Right? Which mm. I mean, that's that's kind of that's the the two you know the total spectrum, right? Yeah. The highest, the high, lowest, the low. And uh, he said it's about 50-50 that he gets asked on a regular basis about that. That's yeah. crazy. What yeah. do uh, – what is your – by the way, hey, are we – Is our, Steve looks a little uh, – the connection. Is it, are, we, are we good? Is it all right? Yeah? Yeah? How's it look, it look and sound on your end good? Yeah, we're good on my okay, end. Oh, we're not recording all this good stuff? Oh, we are, baby. <laughs> <laughs> we are. Yeah. I Yeah, I try to always have them give me like a thumbs up because sometimes – you know, I used to do just a standard, you know – uh, you know, we go, all right, are we good? Or we go, all right, guys, welcome back to the show. But it was just right, like, right, you miss right, out right. on the organic banter. Right. Like, I mean, shit, man, with Sports Center, like, are you guys riffing and, and, and bantering up until the moment? And yeah, do you, right. it, it helps, right? Like, even before I go yeah. on stage at right. a comedy club, which is right. where we met at Laugh Boston, which, which, uh, yeah, we yeah. should tell people our, our mutual, uh, friend and, Recently out of the closet. No, Josh Wolf, who is, uh, but who every guy would be gay for because Josh is just, you know, the most svelte 50 year old man. I with... hate him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You hate him because you love him. He, uh, he had you come out to my show and, and, yeah. uh, and that was dope. But, but the, uh, the backstage or off camera, you know, chatter for me, and then I'd love to hear your take. Like it helps. If I'm just sitting there in silence pre show, I it's not going to dictate how the entire show goes, but I definitely feed off of just chumming it up a little bit and and getting some conversation going, almost just kind of like warming up, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's exactly right. You give a little momentum going into it, but I I think you're onto something here. I also hate that. Okay, here we go. Three, two, oh. one. Take a beat and then go. We're back on so and so. I think you could have a really good time, bud. <laughs> and maybe you do some of this already, like. You know, all the idiots like myself who can't figure out their own Zoom. <laughs> hey, wait a sec. Give me a second. Am I in focus? How's my lighting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think people would get a kick out of seeing how all the people they see on TV and stage, how we're like everybody else. You know, yeah, I can't yeah, yeah. figure out the parent-teacher conference <laughs> with my second grader. You know what I mean? And, like, I look like a total dope to their teacher. Oh, now damn. they're making fun of my kids now, I'm sure, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but that's, that's, that's much better than going three, two, one. Here we go. Roll the T's. Your 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 first sports center was how many years ago now? August one of ninety three, dude. And bro, there was no there was no training ground. So back in the day, right, there was no ESPN two, no ESPN news, no radio. My first shift was like a week after I got in the building, and I was on Sports Center on main ESPN. You know, like holy shit, no farm team, bring, no triple A. They bring kids in now, you know, they sit around here, you watch, you observe for six months. I'm like, what? And then they put them on ESPN News or ESPN2, you know, at, a, at three in the morning when not a lot of people are watching live sporting events. But, yeah, wow. there was no there was no run-up when I was there, yeah. Do you uh, – are you glad that you had to kind of just get thrust into the uh, the wolves then, as they say, like instead I, of having a – I think so. Yeah, it would have been boring to sit around, right, and watch – like I probably needed a week, you know, let me see how – how these guys at the highest level do it, you know, let me, let me see. And then, all right. And, you know, when you're doing local sports, which was my background in New York, mm. you know, 
we're doing three minutes on the 11 o'clock news, right? So I go from doing three minutes of sports to, you know, doing in essence 60 Holy or 90 shit. minutes on, on sports center. Dude, that's the equivalent of an open micer, which is three minutes, headlining a week after they started stand up and doing right. an hour, which, by the way, nobody would pay for. <laughs> so I feel like that would be much, that'd be much harder than, than my thing was. I mean, you know, it's debatable, but I mean, okay. So before we, uh, you know, take a trip down memory lane, take me back to is it Oswego, New York. Where exactly uh, in New York did you grow up? So I grew up, uh, I went to high school on Long Island. Great. Okay. And uh, the big three, uh, big four, if you will, from my high school, you should know them all. Uh, Adam Schefter, of course, yes. right? Yep. All the stories and all the stuff. Um, you know, Entourage, right? Dude, come on. I mean, those guys are, yeah. Jerry, uh, Jerry Ellen, the creator. Of course. Had him on the podcast. Okay. Also from my school. And the very well-known Kenny Dichter of Wheels Up. Whoa. How's that for a, a, a fearsome force from the same <laughs> high school? That's amazing. I've got yeah. I've got me, Rain Wilson, Glendon Rush, and Jaeger Rosenbaum's brother, Sal <laughs> Rosenberg, who's a big rapper in the Northwest, but I think globally, as I just found out, but I didn't know. Right. But because right. even right. even if you've been told Sal Rosenberg is a big rapper, you're still like, all right, let me fucking <laughs> Let me Google that. Like, that's, I, don't, I haven't heard of any big Jew rappers in the last right, ever. Right. So uh, that was my high school. And okay. then I went upstate New York for college. It's a, it's a state university. Uh, it's up by Syracuse. Oh, yeah. And uh, Al Roker went there. Awesome. Linda Cohn. Jerry Seinfeld for a semester or a year. It's really cold up there. Apparently, Jerry didn't like the cold or I don't know. The classes were too tough or whatever. And then he went down to Queens College after that. But that's... Those are my name drops, my claims to fame. I'm not a homework guy or a snow guy. Um, well, that's dope, dude. Okay, so sports have been in your blood. It's it's impossible to not do what you're doing. By the way, one of the goats, dude. You already, before I knew you, man, were in my Mount Rushmore of broadcasters. Thanks. And uh, yeah, dude. I mean, and not just for the, the deep catalog of, um, and you know, you tell me, but like to do hockey, baseball, football, it was what I know that you've done like on the highest level, but you tell me if you've done like coming up, did you, you know, were you jumping into like tennis or golf or bowling? Like, no. So I've never been a cunt. We we joke about it in the studio. Like if you watch the shows very closely, I almost never do the golf highlight. Right. I'm just, I'm not a golf guy. It just, I never got bitten by the bug. Me neither, man. I appreciate it. We're the minority, right? We're the minority. A thousand percent. Yeah. My dad is like, yo, why don't you get into golf more? And there's so many comics that do. And I'm like, I'll golf when I can't play basketball anymore, which is also about now. But, but, uh, but uh, at 38, but I don't know, dude, just fast pay. I need, it's too slow, man. I don't know. I just, and when the joke is I don't do country club sports, right? So the (laughs) golf and the tennis, I sort of leave to everybody else. And they're really good at it, right? Van Pelt and Anderson and Bush Cross and Kenny Maine. And they're all great at that stuff. So I've always been the, the stick and ball, you know, the big four, and growing up in New York, mostly professional sports. And so, you know, doing college football sort of allowed me to see a whole different, you know, avenue, a whole different window into a, a sports people that I've never been around. And that was, wow, the passion that college sports fans have. So, so that was quite an adjustment, too. College fans, do you think arguably are the best fans in sports or is that just too big of a conversation to you break know what? down it's a different kind of fan mm. you know the college football fan man you go, well, i got to go to a big place and again you know where i'm from but for me to do a, a saturday night at lsu right or to go to alabama on a saturday afternoon to go to clemson like you know these are places i probably would have never seen and never experienced and uh, i'm so glad i did uh the passion those people have and the amazing thing is the college stadiums are bigger than NFL stadiums. Right. Most people, if you don't really know, you think the pro would be bigger. College stadiums are bigger. And, buddy, they, they get like six home games a year. Yeah. That's it. So those stadiums are barely touched, right? Now, I still have concerts, and then there's a spring game and all that. But for the most part, it's six or seven dates, you know, at 100,000 fans. <laughs> Wow. And so, and that, and that takes them through obviously the entire year and takes care of those college towns, obviously financially, these awful hotels can charge, you know, $800 a night, three night minimum, you know, 
and uh, and those are the hotels you drive to the door of your hotel room. So, <laughs> oh yeah, uh, dude, the vex. Get my drip there. So yeah, it's, a, it's the college game is a different world, bro, and I loved every second of it. You're not wrong. So I went to SC, uh, USC, 01 to 05. I got one. I think Pete came my freshman year, I believe, right? 01. I think we had one year of Palmer, and then or maybe two. And the sophomore years when Palmer had the won the Heisman in the, in, in uh, 2002, and then it was share, a shared championship. And then my junior and senior years, we won outright. Um, did you go to the Coliseum and experience that? Yes, and I've done uh, I've done the U I've done the USC UCLA game uh, multiple times. Wow! So those were really cool. Uh, I think they were the first to do the dark jerseys together, mm. right? They yeah. were the same the, the home uniforms, whatever. Yeah, and and it looks really cool at the Rose Bowl. I'll be honest, Bud, too. But it's it's really neat at the Coliseum also. So, uh, do you get excited when you see you know because the rivalries with schools like. Uh, UCLA and USC are pretty, uh, you know, extravagant, so much so to where, like, I remember there was one game, I don't know if you were there for it, when a kid streaked onto the field and then Buck Naked was trying to climb the fence and the cops, like, pulled him. And, you know, everyone's going nuts. Who doesn't like a streaker? Even at the Super right, Bowl, right. like, come on. You know, it's such a harmless piece of entertainment that, like, I guess, like, look, if you're completely bare and there's kids watching, yeah, and that's, like, the first – thing you see like that's your intro into that world that that is okay that sucks i hear you but like fully clothed you know they're gonna get tackled and it's gonna be awesome and they'll spend a night in jail and streakers usually i mean i don't know statistically if they're like going on to get jobs at google but like they seem like pretty fun like the guys that if they were at the barbecue you know they're like hey i bet you don't think i could like drink like that whole (laughs) case of beer and then jump into the fire pit and you're like look i don't want to see you do that but i'm not going to stop you either so like uh, this guy, <laughs> this guy was coming down the fence, and they the cops pulled him down the fence, buck naked, and you saw him kind of just go like down the fence and take a couple too many extra hits. But as you guys, as broadcasters, when you see that yeah. stuff, is it like are you, are you just like us? Are you like fucking look at that? Or are you is are you like man, you're breaking the flow of the game? No. So listen, I I enjoy good entertainment like everybody else. I know the cameras are not going to show that, right? We're not going to cover it, right? But I'm certainly watching, and and the the brilliant Kevin Harlan has made like a second career out of announcing the streakers, right? Oh, He's yeah. at the 30, the 20, the 10. He could go, you know? Like oh, yeah. Harlan's gotten a whole second. <laughs> and his first career was already brilliant. Uh, yeah. And now he's added to the lore with his second career. So uh, it's happened on the ice, too. So think about that. Who's Bump come- naked, tackled on the ice. <laughs> That's a whole – see what I'm saying now, right? You feel me now, yeah. Oh, yeah, you see me just adjust, just the pain right. that I was anticipating yeah. from taking a spill on the ice. Wait. You get drilled and tackled on the ice. Those hockey guys aren't playing around either, yeah. Wait, so who's – how often does that happen? Maybe I haven't been to enough games. Uh, Not that not that often. Listen, you got to climb high over that glass. That glass is pretty high, right? Oh so God. somehow you get through – uh, it happened at an Islander game maybe a couple of years ago, and those big deals. Uh, you mentioned Kevin Harlan. Do you have a, a crew of guys that you uh, you looked up to? Like for me, obviously coming into comedy, right? Greg Giraldo, uh, Pat yeah. Oswalt, um, you know Chappelle, Eddie Murphy. Uh, you know, just there's a you know guys that are you know kind of more obscure. Um, you know, even David Cross, and then guys that obviously were like at the top. Uh, the top of the game who were those guys for you or gals yeah so so just getting this monday night job last season you know i reached out to which by the way yeah. fucking unbelievable i mean that's crazy go on but we'll get back into that it was it was crazy to me too but in fact it's it's still crazy good but I, I spoke to uh all three guys who had sort of been in the seat before me uh you know mike tarico and sean mcdonough and joe tessitore were all extremely gracious and that's kind of weird, right, when you say look up to, because they're really my contemporaries, right? Sure. We're all about the same age, you know, varying degrees of experience, but all the same age. But uh, growing up in New York, the guy we all wanted to be, the kid who couldn't play, wanted to announce, and one of the professional idol is Marv Albert, for sure. You hear so many of us out there that sort of have a little tinge of, of sound to them and the and the timing and all that. And, you know, back in my day, he was doing Knicks and Rangers, the 6 o'clock news, the 11 o'clock news, and in between the news, he was going to the Garden and doing a game. Like So that's who we all wanted to be, and I became friends with his son, Kenny, who's now a great broadcaster on just about every single network as well. So, you know, those were kind of the guys. I don't really know, like, I've gotten a little friendly with Joe Buck. Uh, His wife works at ESPN, so I've reached out to Joe a little bit. 
love to talk to Al Michaels one day or Jim Nance. I'm not sure they know who I am, but hopefully one day I get to oh, meet those guys. Oh, a thousand guys percent they do, know. by the way. See, that's crazy. I just assume that probably the same way people assume with comics or actors, you get to a certain level. They're like, oh, you just know everybody. There's a there's a club or there's a boat party every year where like all the uh, the top broadcasters go to kick it. Like, Yeah, but bro, so I'm not at that level. I have, I have the job, you know, for one year, but I don't consider myself at that level. So right. I'm in that, I'm in that second tier and that's a really i think great tier to be in hopefully one day we'll get to that next boat and maybe i'll even have a boat you know <laughs> yeah maybe i'll have a boat that's a but if you make a t-shirt with your face on it saying maybe i'll have a boat i mean <laughs> I'd, I'd buy like 20 of those and give them out to uh to Bro, is, is that a is that a seattle kraken hat you're wearing yeah baby it is yeah so they scored already they scored already with the name the logo the colors the sweaters look great i wanted to ask because yeah. again I've been to maybe eight hockey games total. Two of them were King Stanley Cup games, which yeah. I've spoiled with amazing seats and just. Yeah. And then I've been in hockey. You know, we had Seattle. We had a Triple A AAA team, right? But didn't really go a lot. And and when you don't have a a big you know, professional team, I think really to get um, excited about the sport. I didn't play. I had friends played, but again, not going to it consistently as a kid. That's why uh, hoops, baseball, and, and football were were my sports. And uh, but I've gotten more into it. But I'll tell you this much, dude. You know, the big games, like even the Canada-U.S. Olympic uh, game, you know, a handful of years ago, uh, there are certain games I get real jacked up. And live, it's way better. I always said hockey for me is like the Kardashians, you know. Like, I can't really watch it on TV, but li- but if I saw Kim K and Caitlyn at a Starbucks being like, you know, what do you mean I don't know about men? You know, I, I, you know, I used to be one. Like, I'd probably stick around, order another cocktail. Um, right. So hockey live is like, you know, it's – it's on another level, and I can't uh, uh, wait for and, – and thank God Seattle has, you know, come out to support it, and hopefully it will, you know, make a splash. But um, obviously it was a big deal for Vegas. Does it is it exciting for you to know that more cities get it and, like, should be on board? Yeah, listen, I mean, Seattle is one of my – I have no affiliation to Seattle, but traveling the country for sporting events, like, Seattle is in my top three NFL experience. No shit. I mean, the fans are – the stadium, you know, the best home field advantage, you know, I think in the NFL, you know, Green Bay and Kansas City are good, but there is something special about Seattle. Uh, my hockey pal, Barry Melrose, who I know you know, um, he's always taught. So he coached back in junior, I think Seattle, the Thunderbirds maybe, but they yeah. had a great following there. Uh, the fans really rallied. This is at a much different level, obviously. So it's going to be great. Everything's great in Seattle, man. I, you know, I'd love to see the NBA go back there again. Um, I mean, you know, I thought that was a real shame losing the Sonics, but you know, yeah. that's the business. That's the sports business that we're in. But there is nothing like hockey in the building. You know, unfortunately, and this goes against what I sort of do, you know, you could make the argument the other sports are kind of better at home, right? You, you could make that argument. Yeah. And that's something that baseball and football is fighting very hard against, you know, but but hockey really is in the building, uh, is special. And Listen, I've had an unbelievable, you know, last month here, the NFL rights get re-signed on a massive deal for ESPN, and now we've got the NHL coming back home for seven years, so it's been good. Dude, that's unbelievable. Today's episode of the About Last Night podcast is brought to you by 5-4 Clothing and the Menlo House. If you know anything about me, you know that I like clothes, I love to buy them, I love to wear them, that's what they're for. And you only look good if you feel good, right? That's where 5-4 Clothing comes in. I've been fucking with 5-4 Clothing for years now. They got this company, Menlo House, that's got 5-4, New Republic, Grand Running Club, and Melrose Place, all under the Menlo House banner, and it's a baller clothing company for dudes. They've got t-shirts, shirts, jackets, sweaters, jeans, pants, shorts, activewear, shoes, accessories, and more. And what you do is you give them your sizes, okay, your fit and your style, and they curate the perfect package for you and send it to you monthly. If you want to join the club, the Menlo Club Monthly, it's $59 a month, and you get over $240 worth of apparel. Again, it's the shit. There's other brands out there and companies that do this, but I only fuck with the Menlo House because, well, they're the best. You know, the clothes always fit me perfectly, and I always get compliments on the jackets, the shirts, just got some new hoodies and pants. And they fit me to a T, and that's what you want in your clothes. So, got a special deal for you guys right now. If you go on over to themenlohouse.com, M-E-N-L-O, house.com, and use the promo code 40 menlo ALN, you're going to get $40 off your first month for your discount package. Okay? $40 off the first month. And that includes the Arrowhead button-down plus the Cali Chinos and more. So, go to themenlohouse.com. 
Use the promo code 40 Menlo A L N, 40 M E N L O A L N, and get $40 off your first month. All right? Start looking good and feeling good. And you can't do that unless you're in 5 4 Clover. Did you play sports as a kid? Yeah, I played and I was terrible, as you, you know, as you might expect, right? But I played everything. Adam, I played everything. Uh, and I was just like extremely mediocre on my best day. But I, I love the games, I love to play, I couldn't wait to get in a uniform. And be with my buddies and play. Did this uh, career, was it a fantasy? Like, I, w- I used to mute the baseball games. I told Rick Riz uh, and Kevin Calabro this, you know, the old Sonics and, and current Mariners uh, broadcaster. I told them, had them on the pod, and how I used to mute games and commentate with them because up until about 12, I wanted to uh, be a broadcaster. And I always thought, though, I was like, man, I... You know, I'm not a geek uh, about the the stats and all that stuff, but I know I always thought even at like 12, I was like my gift of gab. I think I'll be able to fill, especially for baseball, like in the booth, you know, and you put me there now and I always bug Riz. I'm like, you got to let me sit in the booth. He's like, you can come in. I can't trust that you're you on mic is going to be uh, baseball appropriate. <laughs> and I'm like, fair enough. You know, you're probably right to not do that. But but um was it something at a young age that you were like, all right, I, I love being around the game. Maybe not playing it is going to be my uh, my future, but being what you're doing now, was it ever a fantasy? I, You know, you say young, like what is young? Like at 10, I wasn't thinking about it. At 15, 16, maybe I started to realize, hey, I, I can't do this. you know. And if I can, it's going to be at a low, low, low level, and it's going to be for about a year. So, hey, how can I – you know, not get the crap kicked out of me every single day, right? And maybe have some longevity and, and make this a career. And so I did what you did with the television set on mute. Oh, wow. And I took it a step further. I went to, you know, Shea Stadium, sat in the upper deck and brought a tape recorder. And my buddies still talk about it to this day. Yeah, because you had the ambiance, right? The organ, the public address, the crowd. And in those days, nobody was going to Mets games. So you could get an entire section of yourself. And I had one buddy who would do the color and in between innings, another buddy would do the fake commercials, and we made it a, a good time. And somebody, some of those guys still have those tapes, so that'd be have some value. But yeah, so <laughs> again, I realized early on I got to do something else. And listen, I I don't think my folks ever thought I could make a career out of this. I think they were trying to be the good parents. They were going to sort of allow me to fail, try out my dream, allow me to fail, and then try to pick me up and you know point me in a direction. And so I, uh, hey man, I'll tell you. I'm the luckiest guy in the industry. I really am. And uh, I've just been so fortunate this whole trip. Man. Yeah, but you're a good dude and you're like kind and genuine. And even when I met you after the show, like I was like, no, oh, yeah, it's, it's everything and more that I see on TV. Um, I just saw, uh, was rewatching the um, uh, Van Pelt's uh, when they did 25 years to celebrate you at ESPN. Yeah. And, yeah. and that guy, again, is another. Um, I was uh, opening for Dan Cook at uh, the Mohegan Sun, and we uh, went yeah. down to play some poker, and, and Van Pelt was sitting across from us. We went over, started chumming it up, actually gave me his number because I asked him, I was like, maybe someday I'll do the podcast, and he was very yeah. kind, and we texted back, and then I was just like, you know, like, you came to my show. Like, he just saw me at a poker table. I was like, all right, I got to, like, feel – I got to, you know, slow play this more. But his words about you to you were like, you know, he's just so articulate, so like you, man, yeah. genuine and 100% himself all the time, um, and – uh and so it, it's like no surprise to see uh, you be cons- this consistent and and the way you talk about how much you love it is yeah. is a rarity, too, because in any job, man, like even to be in it this long and to do as much cool shit as you've done, it's life, baby. There's always things that can get in the way and and get yeah. you bitter or sour about things. So how do you keep your how do you keep the fun part of it uh, alive? Yeah, for you? So uh, first of all, Van Pelt is a super regular guy, right? He'd be right. right. Like, I'm not surprised at all. He gave you his cell phone right away. You're sitting across from him in a poke. I made him laugh. First regular. of all, if I didn't make him laugh, I don't think I would have. I like to, you yeah. always have a quick moment, and I'm like, dude, if you yeah. don't, if you say you're a comic and he doesn't know who the fuck you are, and you don't make him laugh right. after that, dude, you're right. done. Yeah, but he was he was the man. And and it's hard to carry a show like his show, right? Like yeah. people don't realize how hard that is. He follows immediately after the big event. And he's one man, right? He's got Stamp Steve on the side, but he's really a one man act. And you know how you know you know all about that. So the other thing is he can't blend in, right? And he's a six six giant bald guy, right? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I put a hat on, I look like everybody else. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. You know, Van Pelt can't. He can't blend, as Marissa Tomei would say. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I, my attitude is a really big part of it. And that's what I tell like kids who want to be in the business. Like there's so much negativity out there. 
And that's not just now in the last year with all the, you know, the hell that the whole world's been going through. There's just, I don't know if it's a newsroom or I don't know if it's the media or whatever it is. It just seems to be so much negativity. And I'm always quick to remind myself, hey, let's look around for a second here. I'm giving the Orioles score tonight. You know what I mean? Like nothing is too serious here. Yeah. And uh, and they treat me great and they always have at ESPN. We've had our tough times over there as well. And I've been uh, unbelievably lucky uh, to not just remain in the industry, but to stay at the same place. And uh, listen, I got young kids, man. I need to keep this going for uh, you know, <laughs> another decade for sure. So we'll see. Yeah, dude, they're going to have sports and just, you know, think about the toys and another, te- you know, how old are your kids? So my boys just turned nine a couple of days. I've got twin boys Wow. who just turned nine, and my daughter's going to be 11 in a couple of months. So I, I started late, brother. I, I, got, well, I had my fun on the, on the front end, you know? Well, I would love some uh, advice on that because I'm engaged. I'm 38. She's 25. So we're like, all right, we got five, four, five years. But, like, also, you know, man, like, I remember having a friend, Noah Hostetler, uh, related to um, the, uh, the Hostetler yeah. QB. Yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, I think somehow a cousin, a distant cousin, but his dad, Noah's, Noah was my age. His dad, I remember when we were like nine, was like 75. And it yeah. was shocking. It was like he was a fit 75-year-old guy, which we've seen. And those guys are like intimidating to say the least because they're yeah. just like, you're like, what have you done to stay this sharp? Or what are you taking? Where can I get it? And um, uh, so what, I mean, what when did you start how uh what's the, so, what's the secret um, there my ex and i she was 10 years younger than i was we uh i was married at 44 first my daughter at 45 so you know that's okay yeah and then we went again and we got lucky there because we had twins Oof, and boys at 40 at 47 so the twins you know you save on the timeline if you will right yeah, the yeah, math yeah, yeah, yeah. not wait another two years or so <laughs> yeah yeah so i catch a break there but yeah so I definitely look younger. I mean, I definitely look older than my my kids' dads when I see them coming to games and baseball parties. But I think my job still makes me, you know, sort of the cool dad. It does. It does. I want to be the cool granddad, you know, that kind of <laughs> yeah. thing. I'm not ready for that. But uh, I would say you have a few years. Okay. And uh, and then get her going. Yeah. But. Is is are they sports fans? Are they like you know? Do they dig what you do? And do they? I mean, obviously, if they get to go to a really cool event, they really dig right. what you do. But yeah. So um, my two boys are really really into it one son is out of control into it awesome what you know sleeps with his football wide receiver gloves on you know that kind of kid come right? on and when i tell him sam Darnold got traded that's that's going to be a hard <laughs> conversation to have yeah, yeah yeah i have about you know seven number 14 jerseys green and white throwback oh. traditional you know all those. Oh. so i got to put those on ebay or something yeah so. dude uh, but one of the boys is really into it. The other boy is into it also. And my daughter's like, you know, she thinks it's cool. Her dad's on TV. It doesn't matter what I'm talking about. Yeah. Did, was there a, um, I don't know, the same way, like I used to date a, a news reporter, right? And when she was on coming up, did the NBC page program in New York. Um, you know, I think John Stamos might have banged her. We don't, we don't know for sure, but it didn't work out. She was at an SNL party. Stamos, Stamos is trying to talk to me. I got to go. Click. And that was the beginning of the end. But, but she went to Reno. <laughs> She went to Reno to try to, uh, it's like a, an upgrade, like the first market. And just seeing the grind of that, and then I had buddies from SC in uh, sports um, uh, broadcasting and journalism, you know, going to small markets to do, one went from SC to, I think, um, Virginia to be a, a weekend sports guy. And yeah. and did you do that trajectory? Is that the only way or? or- so, I'm, I'm glad you asked. I always, always hesitate. I go back to being the luckiest guy. I didn't have to, okay? And, and I... You know, I caution telling young people who want to be in the business about this. Yeah. Because I'm the I'm the one in a million guy who didn't have that. Now, listen, I tried to get those jobs in those markets, and I just didn't. I remember coming out of school, I wanted to be the voice of the Binghamton Rangers in upstate New York. And they called me in, and they were going to pay me $12,000 a year, year-round, do the games, do sales. And the kicker was on the road, I had a room with the bus driver. And so that's where my mom drew the line, sort of, you know. And I still wanted the job, by the way. And I finished eighth, okay, eighth in the running. So there were seven people who were better than me and wanted that job. Oh. And, and, and so there. So, But the truth of it is, uh, I did start in New York City. My first professional on-air experience was on radio for a long time, but it still was 
Look, it was WNBC, it yeah. was Stern and I missed that station. And at 7 p.m., they went to sports. It was Dave Sims and Mike Breen, who, you know, Dave Sims, the voice of the Mariners, on, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Mike Breen's the voice of the NBA for us on ESPN and yep. ABC. And they would send me to Hofstra, and I would I would make Hofstra my eight-hour full day, and they would put me on, on a, a two-minute taped piece covering the Jets. And I think I got paid 50 bucks a day. So, listen. Uh-oh. Froze. Stevie there? On NBC Radio in New York. So that part of it, I got really, really lucky and made a lot of great connections there. So you're like the Ashton Kutcher of broadcasting, where you showed up, got discovered at a coffee shop. They were like, hey, you should under uh, be an underwear model. And then, boom, movie star. Yeah, outside of the underwear and taking my clothes off, yeah, I'd be exactly like Ashton <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kutcher, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. But no, I man, I was I was lucky. I did have a break. I had one connection, you know, and so I tell everybody, hey, don't be ever embarrassed to take advantage of some kind of connection. You know, a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy, you know, because everybody's going to do that. Why wouldn't you do that? And so, listen, I, I worked really hard and I did all those internships and I gave up my summers and I still work really hard. But you also have to get a little bit lucky, and uh, I've done both. Now. Wait, so you did do internships and, and stuff. So you did, like, have to – you can't just, yeah, show up at ESPN after a week, get be on air, and have not had, you know, a, a, a barrage. Right. Yeah. Adam, let's, let's do this, because this became a really controversial thing. Uh, this was about three weeks ago. Someone Please. on Twitter said they offered someone an unpaid internship – wasn't me. And I chimed in when say, hey, un- unpaid internships were the key, was the stepping stone or something like that for me. And I got hammered. I got destroyed. What are you saying about your worth? Are you telling young people that they're they're worthless? I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and people got after me. Your parents must have paid for your college. Whoa. You know, how did you support yourself while you were getting an unpaid internship? And the whole thing flipped around. And it happens every year. So I have to be really careful about this. But back in my day, and I don't know if the law is the same, these companies could either A, pay you, or B, give you college credit. And what does every company want to do? They don't want to pay you. They want the free labor, and you get college credit for it, right? Right. Now, I went to SUNY Oswego, as we said. I wasn't going to a $50,000 a year school. I think my tuition was two grand a year. And yeah, my folks picked it up. I did work in the pizza joint in Oswego, and but every summer, those two months in the summer, I was getting extra college credit and taking myself on a on a, on the Long Island Railroad and the subway and putting on a suit and uh, and working at these TV stations for free in essence. But the trade off was I met all these great people and I was around professionals for three summers, and therefore when I got out of college, uh, I was I was more ready to go than I would have been otherwise. So. I hate the fact that people are down on these unpaid internships. Uh, it was absolutely one of the keys to my start. And uh, I would tell anyone else who could take such to absolutely jump on it. And, and lastly, I'll say this, mm. and I'm, I'm not trying to you know, blow my own horn here, but I do have this scholarship fund at my school. And they said, okay, what do you want it to be for? And I said, that's what I want it to be for. I want to be able to pay a stipend to a kid who otherwise wouldn't be able to have an unpaid internship, and now they can get that same opportunity, and I'll pick up their rent or their books or their food or whatever it might be. Maybe it's a couple of kids every summer. So um, that's but that, incredible. I'm hot on it because it just came up, but it was a big deal on Twitter. Wow, three weeks ago. Yeah, <laughs> there's nobody there, but there's somebody there, and I see you. Hey guys, comedian Adam Ray here. Thanks for listening to the About Last Night podcast. I hope you're enjoying the episode, and I hope you're doing okay. It's a crazy, crazy time right now. And if you're a little uneasy, I get that, and I've also got the answer. Koi CBD. Say it with me. Koi CBD. Feels good, and it does feel good because I use all their products. I've been fucking with the fellas at Koi CBD since my circumcision, and I'll tell you this much. They're the best in the game, okay? Gummies, bath bombs, tinctures, joints, creams, oils. They got stuff for pets. Koi CBD has been giving the people what they need to feel better, to mellow out, to go to sleep right, to take away the aches and pains with the creams and oils, the bath bombs, make bathing just the best thing ever. You get a little 
the little radiation high from the from the bombs. I don't know what's in it, but fucking goodness and and just all sorts of. It's amazing. Okay, it feels like drugs, and it's not because it's CBD. So if you want to get these amazing products, and I know you do, because they got the Adam Ray stamp of approval, go to koicbd.com and put in the code ALN15 to get 15% off your first order. KoiCBD.com, the promo code ALN15 to get 15% off your first order. Do it today and start living and feeling the right way. And now back to the episode. Yeah, I mean, that's a great response. And I mean, it's, you're not uh, wrong. Like you have to have, you got to pay your dues. You got to take these opportunities when they come because you have to, uh, in any way, shape, or form, like there's no rule book for any, you know, whether it's a, a comedian, broadcaster getting into it, you just have to start getting reps, right? And you have to start being around it. Um, uh, was there a, um, was there somebody at ESPN when you got there and started? So take me to getting that call to going to ESPN because ESPN, what, start in 93, I'm trying to even envision, was it who was there? Patrick Oberman, Eisen, were you Stewart, right? Were you there with just the other goats? Uh, I think I think I beat Rich Eisen there. Uh Stewart and I started almost the exact same day. Wow. Uh that's August 1st of 93. But yeah, it was Berman and Bob Lee, Charlie Steiner, Robin Roberts. Yep. I shared an office with Robin Roberts. Think about that for a second, Amazing. right? Amazing. Uh Chris Fowler. Yep. Uh, and those guys were all there. Ravage. So the story is they called one time and I was a benefit because I was in New York and Bristol's close enough so they could see me on TV and they could hear me on the radio. Was that strategic? W F A N. Say was, it again? Was that strategic to kind of be close by Bristol if that's where you wanted to end up? Um again, I, I really I was not thinking about ESPN. Okay. I was in, in New York City, right? I was living the life. I'm in a high rise in Manhattan. On TV, all my parents, friends, my, my sister, my all my buddies were all there. They could hear and see me. I was on with Imus oh my for God. three weeks doing sports. I mean, think right. Think, and I am at this point, um, uh, I don't know, 24, 25, something like that. Wow. So, yeah. So ESPN calls and I, I tell them, no, like, I'm good, man. I'm in New York City. And then about a month, uh, maybe a year later, they called again and uh, they increased the offer. And we went back to, I was at Channel 2 WCBS TV in New York. I was just doing Fridays and Saturdays, right? I was the number two guy. I said, hey, is there more work for me? Don't make me go. I don't want to go. And sure enough, they said, sorry, Steve, you're too young. It's New York and all that stuff. And um, they've had, you know, 50 sports anchors since I've left probably, right? And I would have never left there. And my agent said, look, it's ESPN. They're not coming back a third time. So I went and I went like, you know, not knowing what to expect. My first night in Bristol, I'm in a hotel. I know no one. It's a Tuesday night. I go to a nine o'clock movie. There's not a single other person in the theater. Not one, no exaggeration. And I figure, all right, they're going to refund my money. And the guy bangs on the glass. Hey, you ready? And I'm like, (laughs) all right. And, you know, true story. And I was like, all right. And obviously it's, you know, it's the greatest move I ever made. But I did not want to go. I was single in the city, living the life, and it was, you know, ESPN has been the greatest thing ever. Wow, dude. That is a, I mean, yeah, that's a, I mean, you're a local celeb. You got all your fam and friends watching you. You're in Manhattan in the fucking early 90s. Like, get out of here. Um, So was there a, I'm always curious about this. Was there a moment where, uh, and then I want to go back to just like first day on air because that's just I think for anybody I remember my first time on stage like the you know the lights everything the conversations you had pre and post but was there a moment um, well actually let's start with that and then I'll and then I'll ask the second question that first day you get in there are the nerves running high has everything you've done prepped you for this moment did somebody say something that might have calmed the nerves did a, you get a phone call from a a friend or an old mentor or a high school coach that was like you know I didn't think you were going to be shit Levy but this is fucking <laughs> impressive you know like I got you know so I got a lot of that you know like last year before Monday night football but the the day Go. one job was Sports Center. There was no ESPN LA, so we are live at two thirty a.m. Eastern time. Okay, live every night two thirty a.m. Eastern. Oh so I don't God. know who's watching that really. And so in those days, uh, I was on with Carl Ravitch. By the way, he was one of the one of the goats. Ravitch. I mean, dude, yeah. baseball tonight. 
right. was literally, I think I might, I mean, if you could do a karaoke version of, dun, 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 yeah. Yeah. I would fucking yeah. do it. And, uh, and Rabbi beat me there by, I don't know, three or six months. So he's, you know, he's, he's ahead of me. So he comes out. So we always did this thing. You, you look at the two shot, a uh, little happy talk, look down, and then you turn to your camera, right? For your one shot for the main thing. So uh, Ravi gives me this great buildup. Here's our new anchor. Want to welcome from New York. Here's Steve Levy. I said, thanks, Cole. We do some happy talk. And I proceed to do the next 35 seconds of my lead in on the two shot camera. I'm so nervous. I forget to look down. So now here's Ravitch next to me. He's sort of like this. He's got nothing to say. He's on the two shot too. And uh, Mike McQuaid, who who's, was the producer that night, he's still one of my many bosses at ESPN. Wow. Great dude. And he's like, in my ears, like, turn, turn, <laughs> left, camera two. Keep going. Steve. Warmer. Turn. Warmer. And, and, no, no, no. 40 straight seconds of Ooh. reading the prompter. On my two shot, I was not going to look down. I was locked in, and uh, and that's how we got started and running. So wow, dude! But then after that, I mean, you get was it almost like, you know, it's like this for me with stand up now. If I go to a new stage, or I got to play uh, Radio City opening for Dane last year, right, which was crazy, a lot of nerves. But guess what? A couple laughs in, dude. I don't want to say it was like every other gig and yep. stage because it feels like you're looking at a matte painting. It's just so fucking, uh, you know, grand. But like. After that first show, were you just kind of like, all right, like, here we go? You know, it, it was the responsibility and the power, bud. Like, you know, you know, doing a big show, like, I was coming from local, right? And, yeah. and I always use the Seattle uh, sort of expression there. Like, I knew when I was doing, you know, MSG TV or Channel 2 in New York, if I was saying something funny about Ken Griffey Jr., he wasn't going to see it, right? It's right, local. Right. So now I'm on Sports Center, and all of a sudden, my words. Oh man! Wait a second. Oh, man. Junior's watching this show, probably oh, man. right for sure. He is. And in those days, man, that was the big show, and that was you know Keith and Dan, right? And so it was really appointment viewing. You know, every player, every uh, GM, every coach and manager, and I I realized that because I started going to games, I'd go down to the locker room, and everybody knew who I was, right? And so that. I was not ready for that. The So with that comes great responsibility. Hey, you know, all these jokes I'm making wearing makeup on a set in little Bristol, Connecticut, that's not funny anymore because everybody's seeing it, right? Whoa. So uh, so I took that very seriously. And I my style, you know, over the years, I don't, I don't make fun. That's not really my thing. My sort of my rule on that is if I think the athlete would agree that he blew it, uh, then, then I can have some fun at that expense. But otherwise, if there's any chance, you know, there was a bad hop, the sun got in his eye or anything else, I'm not making fun of these guys. And I, I always said for all the people in Bristol that anchor behind the desk or really anywhere, it's a real good education to have to go to practice one day, any sport, go in that locker room, sort of face the music. And in those days, Sports Center was on in every locker room, you know, 24-7, because yeah. we ran 24-7. Yeah. And it was, uh, that was really eye-opening and really uh, made you appreciate the responsibility of uh, being one of the many anchors on SportsCenter. That's incredible. Was there a moment where you felt like you arrived, a show, uh, an instance in a, in a locker room or at a game, or maybe an athlete reached out to you online or or via yeah. email? Yeah. It's one of my best ones. So Great. I'm on vacation. I go out to uh, Scottsdale, <clears throat> and um, I go to the Suns game that night, see the Phoenix Suns. Come on. And I am clearly not working. And I'm only telling you this now because I feel like it's past the statute of limitations. I get caught on this. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. So I go to the Suns game. I get a press credential. I sit in the press row, whatever it is. And after the game, I'm going to go downstairs and I want to see Charles Barkley. I just want to shake the man's hand, Come right? Come on, yes. And again, I am not working. So the game ends. I go down to the locker room. And I've probably been on ESPN, I don't know, two, three years at this point. And uh, – I go down to the locker room. There's a media scrum, right? Everybody's huddled around. Barkley's the star. And I stay way in the back, man. Way in the back because these guys, all these people are working here and I'm not working. Yeah. And uh, in the middle of an answer, he points across the room. Hey, Steve Levy, get your ass over here. I'm like, oh, this isn't going to be good, right? So he sits me down in his locker, okay, cracks two beers, okay, and hands me one. I'm like, Charles, it's not cool. It's, not, it's okay. It's okay. Kind of thing. So um, 
So now I'm having a sip. He goes back and is answering his questions, but I feel like a total fool now. You're just sitting the media, there. You know, the, <laughs> the media is trying to ask him more questions. I'm sitting in his locker having a beer with Charles Barkley. Oh. The story gets better, bud. This, this is actually one, this is one of my top three all-time Levy stories. Oh, my God. This really gets better. So, so we go from there. He does his media availability. Everybody leaves. He says, where are you staying? I'm staying at the Phoenician at the time, which was my favorite hotel uh, at the time in Scottsdale. It's still really nice, whatever. Uh, and I'm like, hey, Chuck, I just wanted to shake your hand, man. That's it. We didn't exchange numbers or anything like that. Just wanted to shake your hand, say, you know, I appreciate you. And it's nice to have the beer with you and all good, right? So the next day, I'm in the hotel. I've got some plans that night. The phone rings in the bathroom because I'm fancy. I have a phone in the bathroom <laughs> at the hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a ball and I answer the phone, and I'm like, hello. And he's like, Steve, it's Charles Barkley. I'm like, come on, man. What? Right? So he's like, yeah, it's me. Why don't you meet me out tonight? I'm like, all right, I got some plans, but I'll cancel them. He's like, meet me at a place called Sticks and Jets. I don't know if you know Scottsdale. Oh, yeah. That's why I'm getting married next like, year. 10, 10 o'clock, Sticks and Jets. Yeah. I'm like, sure. So I go. There's a massive line. I'm all by myself, you know, velvet robes, big giant guy out front. Yeah. And I'm going to go up to him and say, hey, Charles Barkley told me, you know, like, you know, like, guys going to be sure. Yeah, he did, right? Yeah. So I go up there. I give him the spiel, Charles Barkley, blah, blah, blah. Get close to the end and it gets even better. Uh, Barkley from across the bar sees me, waves me through, let him through. Okay. Chuck says, hey, I want you to meet my buddy. And his buddy has his back to me, and he is lining up to take a shot with a pool cue, right? And Charles grabs the guy's arm. I'm like, Chuck, let him take his shot. He can, I can meet him in two seconds. <laughs> and he wheels him around, and it's Michael Jordan. <laughs> yeah. And that started the what night the... with me, Chuck, and Mike. Started and, uh, the really, night? Yeah. The great nights in the Levy history. Yeah. Oh, my God, dude. How's that? Yeah. Wait, so what were you even doing in Phoenix? You were just there. You were... On vacation. I went I went I went solo on vacation and I'm not a golfer as I told you. I just went out to Scottsdale and I know some people out there. I was hanging out, really. Went to the basketball game alone and uh Chuck called me in my hotel bathroom. Yep. To, I mean, just, let me, let me, uh, let me am I am I calling you in your bathroom right now? Are you you got one of those fancy bathroom phones? Uh That's really good. Dude. And he's a great dude. I hope you know him a little bit. He's I met him at the dude. NBA Awards 2 years ago yeah. uh and I you know, I'm going to Atlanta to do shows, and I'm hopefully going to use a, a, a connect to hook me up with Kenny and, and go over to the, um, you know, studio. And and maybe, you know, he won't remember meeting me at the NBA Awards because it was just a brief, uh, you right. know, carpet exchange. But, um, man, that story is bonkers. And also, right. a great right. lesson, everyone out there, get comfy with yourself so that you can hang by yourself. Because, like, yeah. whether it's going – have you always been that way, going to movies, shows? I mean, you came to my show, I think, solo, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, I have no problem with it. I like company, but I'm, yeah. I'm good being alone too, you know, and, uh, I got a nice mix. And again, when you have three kids now, it's, it's nice to get a little quiet time alone For sure. too. So it works out. Dude, that is, I mean, and that just is a great, that story is amazing on many levels, but also how it starts. Chuck, yeah. and this isn't a testament to you on and off, uh, camera, uh, bud, that like he got a sense of you hadn't met Chuck right up until this point. Never. So no. he's. He's seeing on TV the version of a dude he he digs and wants to have a beer with and not just have a beer with at the bar across the street from the arena or at his home or at golfing in his fucking locker while he's getting interviewed. Oh. I, I mean, and then to invite you out later and then to like, you know, it's almost like to bring you around Mike, like he, he something again must have he picked up on from you, gotten a sense of you. It's not like he wanted to brag to you that he knew Mike, right? Like, it's not oh, like right, he was. Right, And I, I really went in just to say hello. I, I wanted to introduce myself. I didn't think he would know who I was. But that also, that made me be, you know, after that night, I'm like, whoa, I got to be on my best behavior at all times, you know, on and off the air. Yeah. Because, you know, people are watching this show. And, you know, and that's that's obviously, you know, says great things about Sports Center, the franchise and ESPN and all that stuff. And uh, I've been really lucky that way. I met a lot of great people. Um. That story is, uh, I mean, <laughs> that's unbelievable. Now, uh, give me game. Uh, we talked about the Monday night gig, which, I mean, yeah. again, dude, I think I sent you a message through Twitter about that because yes. we didn't have any yeah. contact. But that to me, dude, is, is, um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know in, in sports when you're coming up what gigs are looked at as like the mecca. Like for me, comedy, right? You're coming up. SNL is somewhere you're looking at. Getting a stand-up special for sure. Being in movies. 
Um, you know, there's a there's a, a you know a, a variety of things that we all kind of have our own gauge on, like what this means. You know, p- putting a certain gig up on a pedestal. But Monday Night yeah. Football, dude, it's. I mean, it's been a long. It's been around for how long? 1970. And just, it's almost more important than Sunday Day Football. In a, in a certain regard, you know what I'm saying? Like there's so much because it is. And I think that argument can definitely be made. It's one game. It's at night. It's fucking everybody's watching versus spreading out. And now even with like Sunday with Reds, I mean, it's like there's just, your eyeballs are going 19 different directions. Um, and to get that gig, dude, I mean, I want to hear from your perspective on what it meant to you. And uh, did you cry? Did you, you know, get hammered? Did you eat a cake? Did you? fucking call up Charles and be like, dude, like, you know, remember, remember me? Like, you know, like, what did you, did you call up old girls that broke your heart in middle school and be like, you know, fucking, you know, you just lost out on tickets to a game. Like what, what did you do? So, uh, Chuck did, by the way, DM me much like you did. Yeah. That's how that I did hear. From wow, Chuck dude. Huge. Uh, so listen, it was, it was the unattainable, right? Yeah. Because as you, you know, one game, it's one chair, right? And you just don't expect the chair to ever open up. And that's why for so long it was unrealistic. And when I mean so long, it was like as a kid, right? So I got to ESPN, you know, we had hockey back in the day. We were doing, you know, four games a week. So that's four chairs, right? And during the playoffs, we're doing two games a night every night. So there was so many opportunities. College football, right? We have 14 games a weekend or whatever it might be. So college basketball, right? There's just a... Uh, the volume of games we had, mm. but the NFL for us, ESPN only had the one seat and for it to open up in the fashion it did, uh, you know, a bunch of times, just, you're not expecting that. You're not anticipating that. And to finally get the call and I joke, you know, I, I needed the world to end or come to a stop for me to get the gig. Um, but that's, that's kind of what happened. And I did, you know, I didn't cry. Uh, I'm not much of a crier, but my daughter did. Cool. Um, brief backstory here. So he went to summer camp. And before that, back in March, I showed him an article that said, hey, I was among the candidates of those who could potentially be on Monday Night Football. My kids knew what it meant to me. And uh, once in a while, they would ask about it. They go to summer camp, the only sleepaway camp in the country that was open last summer. Right. Think about that. Wow. Right. Yeah, in uh, Camp Aquila in Maine. Shout out to my buddy Ephraim. I grew up with him in Queens. He's the owner of the camp. Anyway, he opens. I get my daughter back, bud. This true story. After five weeks away, a 10-year-old girl, and the hug and the kiss was unbelievable. Welcome home. How was your summer? And the next thing out of her mouth was, Dad, did you get the job? Like, just the awareness, right? At, at age 10, especially a girl, right? They're consumed with themselves, yeah. right? Yeah, at camp. She's got, you know, stories for right. days to fill the moment right. with. Arts, how was arts and crafts, honey? You know, you have 22 bracelets on your arm. Tell me about that. But <laughs> that she thought about that. And at that point, bud, I, I thought I was in good shape, but I hadn't gotten it. And another month goes by or so. Oh. And I finally, I get the good news. I talk to my three boys and I try to be the super parent. Here's a teaching lesson kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Guys, four years ago, I really wanted this. I didn't get it. I didn't get down. I fought harder. I tried harder. Two years ago, I wanted it. I didn't get it. I tried harder. I didn't let it beat me. I kept working hard. Blah, blah, blah. You know, that that whole try to make the lesson father knows best thing. You have to. That's a big lesson. Right? And and it's true, by the way. It is true. Fuck yeah. And then, I got on my knees. We're in the driveway and their mom's about to pick them up. And I said, I want you to hear from me guys. I got the job and I'm almost tearing up telling you the story now, but my daughter lost it. Oh man. Uh, She gave me a hug that I will never forget. She would not let me go. And she got hysterical crying like tears of joy. And daddy, I'm so happy for you. So happy for you. And one of the twin boys said to me, you know, good job, dad. Like that was it. And then the other son said, wait a second. So I can't watch Monday night football with you anymore. <laughs> oh and my like, God, dude. Dagger. Oh, that's good point. Pretty yeah. sharp. I said, we yeah. watch Thursday nights together. But yeah. The three different perspectives were Amazing. really cool. Uh, but I'll never forget that hug from my daughter and her tears. And she would not let me go. So they knew what it meant to me and wow. to call my parents and sister. 
I'm really lucky to still have my parents at this point in my life and uh, that they're of such good health and to share it with them, you know, oh, yeah. for the whole ride. So the Monday night thing has been, Oof. has been just magic and you know, I got it. And now I want to try to hang on to it, you know? I mean, yeah, there's going to be no problem there. Hey guys, Adam Ray here for the About Last Night podcast. Hope you're enjoying this episode. Obviously, it's a very difficult time for everyone right now. We're all uh, challenged in finding a day-to-day routine that, uh, that makes our lives uh, consistent and awesome. And if there's something that's interfering with your happiness right now or preventing you from achieving your goals, BetterHelp Online Counseling is there for you. Uh, BetterHelp is a professional counseling service online, private, and it's so convenient. Um, I've used it for a little bit now. It's truly the only way uh, that I've found uh, to help get uh, my own issues dealt with on my own time uh, at my own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions plus chat and text with your licensed professional counselor right now. They're specialized in depression, anger, stress, anxiety, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief or relationships, uh, sleeping, which I have a lot of uh, trouble with, trauma, self-esteem, anything that you share with them is confidential. And guess what, if you're not happy with your counselor for any reason, at any time you can request a new one for no additional charge. There's 3,000 US licensed therapists across all 50 states, available worldwide. And again, there's four ways to communicate with them, text, chat, phone, and video. You can start communicating in under 24 hours. It's available on any desktop, mobile web, Android, and iOS apps. Schedule a video or phone session, generally weekly, unless your therapist schedules more, uh, unless you just are really not sleeping and need to get some uh, some some additional chats in. Uh, there's broad expertise in the network, which may not uh, which may not be locally available in many areas. Financial aid is available for those who qualify. It's secure. It's convenient. It's professional, and above all, it's affordable. All right, it's truly the most affordable option I found. So right now, all ALN listeners are going to get 10% off your first month with a discount code about last night. So why not get started today and start making some changes for the better in your life? You deserve it. So go to betterhelp.com slash about last night. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor that you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash about last night. Betterhelp.com slash about last night and get 10% off your first month with promo code about last night. And now back to the episode. Your voice too, dude. First of all, that story is phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that. Like that's just an, and I'm glad that you did take time to focus on the, you know, the disappointment and the trudging forward because man, like that is, there are a bunch of things I could at this stage in, in my life equate like what, you know, what life is like as far as like, you know, one foot in front of the, the amount of analogies and the, the. I mean, the nose I've had in auditions and and com- just in so many things and the resilience and and mental fortitude you have to and and thick skin develop in any I think in any profession in life and especially more so when you're trying to challenge yourself, ask a lot of yourself, heighten your expectations of yourself, strive for more. Right? There's always going to be more. I think disappointment and struggle and yeah. read 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 my Twitter mentions if you want to have some thick skin. You know what I mean <laughs> after after a Monday night football game, but. Listen, and I want to turn it around on you. I'll ask you this question because so. Please, yeah, it's say, fucking enough about you. Jesus Christ, yeah. Say, <laughs> hey. Whose show is this? <laughs> let's say five years ago, maybe it was six. I'm not exactly sure of the timeline, but I had a chance to get Monday night, okay? I was in the running. I was in a handful of names. I was, I wouldn't have turned it down, but you know what? I was not ready for it. I was not ready for it. And I, if I had gotten it for whatever reason, I might have flamed out and never gotten a second chance. So, you know, how about you? If you would have gotten it at 21 or 22 and you get the Showtime or HBO special, Oof. you're not you're not turning it down, though, right? No, you're I not mean, turning it down. No, because I think even no, because you want to always, I think, act and seem and feel and trust in yourself that like I am, you know, I, I can step into any moment and whatever. But no, looking back, hindsight, for sure, I'm, I, I if I had had uh, any special out there uh, earlier than than what I have, like. Yeah, I mean, and I think that is a uh, consistent with most comics where they look back and go, "Oh, there are always." And I just talked with uh, Bill Burr about this, where it was just you know, more stuff you add to a bit, that joke got better or had a better take on something. You know, it's just how it is. It's a, it's you know, where you just are growing since the thing that's now out there. But um, 
I mean, you don't have that with with calls, do you? Where you're, you know, you'll call a certain game. Do you go and even watch the game tape, or is it so in the moment uh, that you just have to kind of almost like an audition, right? Where I go in, I go, I did my best. I I hope hopefully was prepared and left everything on the table, and now I I can't. It's out of my control, right? They're picking wallpaper at this point, or the casting, whatever. When you're doing a game. Do you go back and and think about oh shit there was that or I I could maybe say this better or word this better or here's a fun phrase I could say about this moment absolutely and I would cool. I would tell you this and this might surprise you Adam I would say every single football broadcaster watches their whole game back every week now I, I, let me I'll say for the play by play guys Whoa. every college play by play person every NFL play by play person I believe watches their entire game back every single week. That has become, I know no other way. As far as I know, every single person does it. Not only do I watch my game back, okay, I am then going to watch the TV copies of the two teams I'm going to see next week, right? I mean. So I'm that's three full NFL games I'm watching in leading up. And then we also watch TV uh, tape back as a group in these, you know, massively long production meetings. Yeah where we watch with the rest of the people. So, yeah, we uh, – and I do – hey, I kick myself every week. You do. You know, I could have been quicker on that. I got the wrong yard line. It was third and two. It was really – no, it was third and three. You know, those kind of little stuff, uh, little mistakes. And um, so, yeah, I, I think it really helps a lot. Um, but, again, I, I was going back to the being rushed. You can be rushed to the big leagues, and you might not get a second chance, mm. you know. And so when that time comes, when you take that, you got to be sure you're ready, I think. You know? Speaking of being ready, are you just ready for like certain moments? Like I, like let's just say, for example, the uh, the fail Mary, the Hawks and Packers, right? The, uh, um, you know, was it a catch? Was it an interception? Um, when there are big moments about to happen in a, let's just say, football game, do you get extra fired up? Do you get nervous because you're like, man, this call, like even that Zags UCLA game, right? Like, I yeah. mean, that was yeah. crazy in the moment. And it's like, you have to know that coming down to it like that, that that's a possibility always. But do you, do you relish in that? Do you overthink it? Do you try to think one step ahead? So I, I hope it's coming, right? Yeah. I am naturally excitable. That's sort of my style. You are. So it's I awesome. To, I have to check myself down, you know? <laughs> yeah. As the moment's getting bigger, I got to get myself in check. And I remember um, uh, the Ravens, Ravens Browns this year, this last year, and um, Lamar Jackson, right? He has to leave the game. We can't find him for 45 minutes. Yeah. Two minute warning comes running out of the locker room after an IV or whatever else he was doing in the locker room. I'm not to say. Yeah. And uh, he right. comes on the field, no warm ups for a fourth and five, and throws a touchdown pass. Like that's one of those things. Like you can never be prepared for that. Yeah. But in that break at the two minute warning, I'm like telling myself, "Hey, Levy, hang in there, calm down, keep it cool. You got this together." That's what I'm sort of talking to myself. And because you know something great is about to happen, right? You could, either way, you're going to have a big moment. Yeah. So uh, I never have to pump myself up because I'm always up. I got to go the other way. I got to keep myself in check and bring it down. Because you, I guess you do want to try to be, I mean, somewhat neutral, right, for these games. But oh, like yeah. if you are genuinely excitable like you are like that's and and people the fans and i'll just speak and i know i'm speaking for millions like that's what's uh great about your voice and your style and your game is that you have an appropriate amount of like raw like hum, human uh human enthusiasm that you feel like is not put on you know and that's what i think you know at the end of the day makes a great broadcaster as you go oh cool this guy's genuinely He's just up there to call this for us and watch it, but like I feel like I'm sitting next to him. Yeah, well, that and one of the criticisms of me, you know, first quarter of the season was, you know, Levy seems like he's he's, ha he's too happy to be there. Well, you know what? I was happy to be there. <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> what a you fucking kidding? crazy Jesus! Right? Like he, I mean, it's like he dreamt about this gig. It's like it's special to him or some shit. I, it's like his kids yeah, were, happy were happy for. Oh my god, dude! I'm happy for twenty years being there. You yeah. Know? Um. I, before we wrap this up, and thank you again for making time, dude. This has been uh, the shit, and uh, and hopefully I get to see you live at a, at a game. I I mean, I'm sure there'll be a. I know Goodell wants all the fans in the stands, so I mean, man, I don't know what I'll have to do, or or um, you know how many beers I'll have to bring up to the booth to uh, be able to come to the uh, uh, stadium. 
uh, to say what up, or maybe I can at least just you know take you out to a, a Seattle steak dinner or something. But um, buddy, when things hey when things get back to normal, you're my guest. It doesn't have to be Seattle, wherever you want to come. Oh, dude. Well, you know I'm traveling all over. And want to hang out? Okay, cool. Uh, I do want to know because, and I don't know if you're aware of this. So I'm on uh, NBC's Young Rock, uh, the Rock show about his life, yeah. and um, I'm only uh, I've only been in a couple eps this season because who I'm playing is. Um, uh, in this season, it only takes you up until about when Dwayne's in college and not yet into the wrestling world. You probably don't know this. I can't wait to watch your reaction of this because you are tied. Uh, I mean, the XFL, you were, I mean, that. first of all, tell us your uh, involvement with the XFL, the, uh, the first go around. Yeah, so listen, in all these years, I've never done a championship game, right? I've always been the second guy or the third guy, I get the conference championship. But with the XFL, I was the lead guy and... Uh, Along with Greg McElroy, we were going to do the XFL championship game, and and we had um, would have been so much fun. And you know, week five, we get we get wiped out, everything gets shut down, and um, so it was neat to be on that project. It was great doing pro football with great reps for me, and how really different it was with all the access, right? Yeah. Interviews in game, the quarterback just ripping his offensive coordinator after coming off on a fourth down. Like I mean, we just saw. So many unique things. And I I really, I felt bad for those people. I really think if not for the pandemic, the XFL would have gone on and and would have had a nice life and a long success rate. Yeah. So, uh, so do you have any Vince McMahon stories? I never got to meet Vince, man. I was, I was really looking forward to it. Well, you can meet the TV version right now, Steve, because that's who I'm playing. You're (laughs) fired. Yeah. That's who I'm playing. I'm going to have to take steroids in season two if we get one, because as you and all the viewers are looking at my body right now, you're like, really, dude? I can see maybe a, <laughs> maybe some extra shoulders. But yeah, so I played Vince in season one, Young Vince, circa 85. And um, I mean, it's the shit, dude. I mean, I've become buds with The Rock and like, you know, right. it's just, uh, the story is crazy. I don't know how big of a wrestling guy you are, but but that uh, I'm hoping the show goes that deep to where it gets like Vince XFL, which if that is the yeah. case, they'll probably recast because like, you know, I can definitely do do more push-ups and I can eat some eat some fish, but like those Popeye arms are not made from just uh, you know regular regular bicep curls. Dwayne's uh, Dwayne's a good guy. He, he had me in a couple of I did a couple of cameos in a couple of his movies. Yes, I was always in in scenes with him, and he'd be like, you know, hey, look, he'd whisper in my ear, you know, don't bleep it up, you know, in front of everybody. <laughs> And they're doing, you know, so they're doing 20 takes, right? Yeah. Which is what they do in the movie. Yeah. That's standard. I've been around a couple of them. Yeah. I just don't want to be the one to mess it up, no. right? You got, I got, I got 150 extras behind me, you know, <sighs> who they're spraying down to look like they're sweating in a football game. And they got to walk the corridor every time. Yeah. And so uh, he's a really good dude. He was really nice to me. And uh, I was really nervous. I was really nervous. And I was playing myself. But I was still really nervous. That's so that. funny, even just to play yourself. Wait, what movie? Yeah. What movies? Uh, game plan, yeah, right? I mean, uh, the game plan, yeah. which was really a really good one. I thought. Sweet, um, yeah. I was in Tooth Fairy, which had a little a uh, little hockey for uh, Dwayne. I don't know if he did his own skating or not. You'd have to ask him yeah. about that. Thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'd be no. I'd be uh, an idiot to not. And I know you've spoken about it uh, like a broken record, but I have a comics take and appreciation for it. So. Okay. You know, the um, I don't know what year this was, but look, people have been canned for slip ups on air. They've also become viral sensations. Uh, Even the boom goes the dynamite kid is hopefully somewhere, you know, on a boat with Dan Bilzerian just getting, you know, every sort of, you know, drink and and type of person just enjoying his his existence. But the. um so I don't remember what year it was or how deep into ESPN and how many broadcasts you've had. Maybe you can give me that um, uh, setup. But you uh, you have a quick little slip up, and you're supposed to say bulging disc, and you said bulging dick. But you recovered. One letter. One letter. One letter. Dude, one letter. I love that you said that, dude, because that's what I was just like, man. Just even now. I mean, to go however many shows you had prior to that, it's already such a expected no empathy that people have for you because, I mean, prompter, but I, I would l- like to assume that, you know, the banter and you're adding stuff here and there, right? I mean, or is it all just word for word all the time? Or are you able to get to a point to where you can add the Levy flair? 
the show has changed a great deal. Gotcha. Okay? It was much more scripted back in the day. So this was uh, 95. So I was there two years. Uh, Dan Patrick had to take the night off for some reason. Yep. Still I'm sitting next to Keith. If that's not intimidating enough, we're on Monday night, immediately following Monday night football, the <laughs> biggest audience. We welcome in the whole crowd, all the eyeballs. And uh, it was Maurice Hurst of the New England Patriots. And uh, so people wanted to blame the poor prompter kid. I typed it into the prompter. It was typed correctly. I just misspoke. I just said the word wrong by one letter. And uh, so Keith, of course, has the great line. Like as funny as the blooper was, it, Keith has the great line. He says, uh, Steve, do we have any video of that? Which, of course, you know, brings the house down. Now the yeah. cameras are shaking, right? Because everybody's <laughs> laughing. Really? Everybody uh, on set, yeah? Right. And then the other thing, piece of it was, I had to then immediately go into a 90-second video rip oh, yeah. of like career-ending injuries oh, from yeah. the day before. And and then, even worse, <laughs> uh, the following story was going to be out of a figure skater who died, okay? Oh, God. <laughs> and in television, as you know, if you say, hey, we're not going to do that story, the quicker, hey, kill the story. So we're going to kill the figure skating story because yeah. everybody's out of control laughing. Oh, no. And so they go, all right, kill the dead figure skater. And so everybody, you know, that's in everybody's <laughs> ears now, right? So, right, it perpetuates oh, God, itself. Dude. Oh, God. And we can't control, I can't control myself. <laughs> He's just taking his glasses off to wipe his tears out of his eyes like this. Oh, my God. People running down the hallway with you know, 20 tapes underneath their arms. You know, back in the day, the three-quarter inch tapes. Yeah. I had 50 voicemails <laughs> by the time I got back to my desk. Oh, yeah. And I did. I, I thought I was going to get fired. Yeah, of and course. Nor Norby Williamson calls me the, uh, the next day. He's still my boss to this day. Um, and he said, hey, that was some of the funniest television I've ever seen. Keep up the great work kind of thing. So I was like, wow. Dude. And so, yes, to this day, Adam, to this day, honestly, once a month, people come up to me still and say, hey, you're the bulging dick guy. And awesome. I'm like, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I am, you know. dude. I mean, look, if, yeah, if that had been the end of the road, you wouldn't be pumped to share that no. memory. But, dude, that's crazy. And I love that your boss had a sense of humor. But, again, I love that you powered through because you literally – didn't even break, dude. Auntie, I mean, I would be maybe because of just a moment in the stakes, but you were like bul bulging dick, disc, and like went right to it and kept talking, dude, your eyes. But then what I loved, and this is again like just from the comic, you know, set of eyes, you could hear after a while when you start to go into the long video, you start to laugh, you start to smile, you start to like break a little but again dude you still were just dialed in but the right. fact that you like it the you weren't too big for that moment and it was like started to kind of pepper in like was very uh awesome and i'm sure you know i'm sure that's what your boss like appreciate too is like you didn't like and because also there's no prep for those moments you saw on snl no. i think jenny no. slate famously got fired on snl for saying shit and then be like oh fuck or shit or or she she paused in it and and broke character because she was so nervous and obviously, you know, a little bit of a, a different time and, and more sensitivity around everything. But uh, the fact that you just powered through, dude, was like, I mean. It won't go away. It, it's the gift that keeps on giving because it's a hard thing to say, right? You're flying through a bulging disc. You can see how you can make the mistake. Yes. And no less than 10 sportscasters have followed me, <laughs> made the same exact mistake. And then I'm no always the way. guy who always show my clip first. <laughs> Levy was the first guy to do it. But absolutely, that has happened multiple times to multiple excellent sports broadcasters. As and it sometimes should. I'll reach out, hey, welcome to the club. You know, that <laughs> Dude, we got a jacket for you, man. That says Bold, "Bulging Dick Club." It's don't wear it. Don't wear it outside because people aren't gonna get it. <laughs> it's gonna actually be kind of a yeah. It can be a turnoff for most social situations. That's amazing, dude. Well, thanks for uh, jumping back into that story because it's just like you know, again, like the comedy around it. Again, aside from the professionalism, and I love the fact that it was. That's amazing to hear that your boss was like, dude, that was amazing. Versus. You know, could have been like, how dare you? How dare you get that word wrong? That was that was the one thing I asked when we hired you was not to say disc and dick and mix them up. It's like, dude, nobody ever said that. Um, <laughs> Steve, you're the man, dude. I uh, This was so great, dude. It flew by. I mean, I can't wait to like kick it uh, live in the flesh uh, when things resume and, and have some, uh, some drinks and, and watch sports. But, dude, huge congrats. It's so... 
I feel honored to to even know you and that you even have even seen me in my element and like you're just such a a, a goat in this industry, man. And like you're, just, I feel like just turning another chapter, man. And like the Monday Night Football gig is just, uh, I can't even describe how pumped I am for you. So anyway, I appreciate that. And listen, hey, I, I've done a lot of these, and this was really a lot of fun for me too. So thank you for having me. You got it, bud. Continued success. And yeah, let's get let's get out where there's no uh, no microphones and cameras in front of us. Done. Just hang out. Well, no, I can't do that. I'm I'm gonna tape all of our hangs, but but I'll definitely see it. <laughs> see you soon. Got to get that content, baby. <laughs> no joking. Yeah, for sure. All right, bud. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, man. Later, see bud. Mmm, Zoa. Thanks, Rock. Guys, Adam Ray here for the About Last Night podcast. Hope you enjoyed that episode. It was a good one. A lot of laughs, a lot of tears, a lot of. Uh, stuff to uh to think about and chew on huh because that's what life's all about chewing on the good stuff nobody said that maybe denzel did maybe tom hanks did maybe they said it together in philadelphia the point is click subscribe right here on the aln logo so you can get more episodes and stay up to date when new content drops highlights animations clips it's all here for you baby i'll see you next time well i don't know how to blink